who is our true teacher and our true mentor, without which we would not be able to do anything in the spiritual life. So if necessary, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day in praise and worship and in glorification of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us and our families, all the logistical grace blessings you've provided for us, our health, our freedoms, our prosperity, your word, uh, certainly your spirit that strengthens and empowers us, our spiritual gift that we are learning about in these doctrines and all that you have done for us, Father. We just thank you for everything that you have given and provided for us. And we ask that you continue to pour out Uh, your grace onto us and meet our every need so that we may walk in your will and your plan. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for our church, protecting and guiding it, providing for our every need as well. We ask that you continue to lead us to serve and glorify you as members of the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, to reach out to those who are lost and dying in our local area and throughout the world, and also to edify the souls of those who do believe so that they are strengthened to glorify you. So, Father, we thank you for our time that we have together this evening. We ask that you lead us now in concentration and focus on the study that you have for us and also to lift us, lift up our hearts in song and praise. In Christ's precious name, amen. Yes. It's dead. No, we've been looking at it already. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, uh, and I knew I knew something was wrong with the air conditioning. You saw the door open. That's right. I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. Okay. All right. You all, all rise, please. For our doxology. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Thank you, and please be seated. By the air conditioner, right? Yeah. If you keep that on auto, right? When the, uh, when the temperature comes to where it's supposed to be, yeah. the fan shuts off. Yeah. But if the fan's continuously running, you're going to have a hell of an electric bill. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, just to let you know. That's okay. The auto is All, right. All right. Good. Thank when you. It drops down and kicks back on. Yeah. Okay. It's like in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right, so uh, let's turn, thank you for the doxology, and uh, let's now uh, turn in our Bibles. Let's go to, um, let's go to, uh, well, start with Ephesians chapter 4, and then we're going to be in 1 Corinthians in just a minute. But as you know, Ephesians 4 is all about the believer's walk and walking uh, in Christ and walking worthy of the calling by which we have been called. In uh, this third section, which is verses 7 through 16, is all about the spiritual gifts, the communication spiritual gifts that Jesus Christ gave to the church. Again, the grace gifts from Christ to the church and those important communication gifts so that the church could begin and then continue to grow afterwards, after uh, we had received the completed canon of Scripture. So uh, we're talking about unity inside the body of Christ, and this is how we have unity, by learning the Word of God and edifying our souls with the mind of Jesus Christ. So in verse 11, we have those four communication gifts that have been given to the church and for the church. These are grace gifts given to us by Jesus Christ and also uh, uh, personally given to us and deeded to us by God the Holy Spirit at the moment of our salvation. But these four gifts are the ones that Jesus Christ had decided and assigned during the church age so that the church could grow and edify and ultimately glorify the Father and the overall body of Jesus Christ. So those four gifts include apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. So we've been noting each of those. We noted apostles on Tuesday night. Tonight we're going to talk about prophets and evangelists. I tried to get in pastor teachers tonight, but there was too much information on prophets and evangelists. So we'll do that on Sunday. 
and uh, finish up uh, this mini doctrine of these four spiritual communication gifts. So tonight we're going to talk about the second communication gift of authority, which is the temporary gift of prophet. And just as the gift of apostle was temporary until the completed canon of Scripture around 96 AD, so too was this gift of prophet, which too was a communication gift, like apostle, to give the mystery doctrines for the church age and eschatology when the Bible hadn't been completed for us, when the mystery doctrines hadn't been written down and then circulated in the various letters and epistles that we now have in the New Testament. So again, in Ephesians chapter Four in verse 11, it says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. And remember, on Tuesday night, I talked about pastor teacher is one gift, not two, based on the Greek context and also the context of both the word shepherd and uh, poimeno and didakalos for, uh, for teacher and how they're used throughout the New Testament. They both are teaching gifts and they are one gift used synonymously. So it says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Jesus Christ. So let's now turn to 1 Corinthians and let's look at verse uh, chapter 12, actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is right after the book of Romans. <clears throat> and so we're talking about this gift of prophet. Uh, to give you a little bit of etymology and the definition as to uh, what this gift is all about and what the word itself means, ultimately we have the word prophet in the English. It is somewhat transliterated directly from the Greek into the English language. Prophetes is the Greek word that we have before you. The English letters on the left for the Greek, and then you see the Greek letters on the right. And again, you can compare those two. But this was an interesting Greek word that was in existence much before, again, the writing of the New Testament. And it was used uh, in ancient Greek for various communicators of various things. But predominantly, let me go to the next slide, Predominantly in the secular language use of this in the Greek, ultimately it meant one who foretold, a fortune teller. Well, it was used for somebody who spoke divinely or was divinely enabled to speak on, be, on behalf of the divine or uh, given uh, different oracles to speak on behalf of uh, the divine, whatever the case. But it also had a connotation of somebody who would look into the future and speak about things in the future as well. So again, they used it for the different pagan religions and uh, various people that were associated with that. But at the same time, it really just talked about anybody that was a communicator or a messenger as well. So simply inside the Greek language, it talked about a preacher or just generically a speaker. So this is an individual who spoke typically with some type of authority behind them, and they would speak whatever. Ultimately, it could be information for the day. It could be about a warning. It could be about uh, prosperity that's coming down the pike, or even they could even talking about an individual's future or the future of a society, a country, nation, whatever the case may be. This word was picked up and utilized in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, the original language of the Hebrew of the Old Testament, and it was picked up and used for the prophets of old as well. So we can also look at some of the ancient Old Testament prophets and understand a little bit about them and then bring that into this picture for the New Testament gift of prophecy and the gift of prophet also. But there is a very distinct difference between the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet that we'll talk about in just a minute. So when we talk about the New Testament gift, the gift that was given for the church, it was the second in order of merit in hierarchy inside the church. And that's what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 28. So let's look there and again in verse 28. <clears throat> And again, after talking about the body of Christ and being members of the body of Christ, in verse 28, 
It reads, And God has appointed in the church first apostles. Again, we talked about them on Tuesday night. They were the lead in authority. They went out and did the missionary journeys. They had, you know, the combination of all the gifts, really. They were prophets. They were evangelists. They were miracle workers. They could speak in tongues. They could do all of the things. But the main thing is that they had authority over the church and taught the church the mystery doctrines for the church age after delivering the gospel message inside a certain area. So they had the highest authority, first apostles, and then it says second prophets. And that's what we're talking about now as well. And that was a very important gift in the early church, which we'll continue to speak about. And then number three would be the teachers, the didaskalos. Again, the pastor teacher uh, that we continue to have today. Then again, in the early church, miracles and gifts of healing helps, which continues to be a spiritual gift today. Administration, various kinds of tongues, another type of communication gift that no longer exists. And then it goes on to say in verse 29, All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. Now, we already studied this passage in regard to the spiritual gifts in general. And remember, Paul was chewing them out because they were tripping over themselves, trying to get the greater gifts, and especially the abuse of the speaking of tongues in that day, even though it was a legitimate gift at that time. But as Paul said, you know, go ahead and desire the greater gifts, but I'm going to show you something even better by what you think are the lesser gifts and the impact that they have. So that's, again, what uh, verse 31 is all about. But going back to verse 28, the second in authority inside the early church was the gift of prophet. And we also see that in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 12, 10, chapter 14, verses 1 through 40, uh, all speak about uh, the gift of prophecy inside the early church. And again, in uh, chapter 14, that's Paul chewing out the Corinthians once again and really talking about the abuse even of that gift and the uh, appropriate application of it in that day and age. So, So uh, the reason that this was so important is because it was a teaching ministry. These were the individuals who had the divine inspiration of the mystery doctrines for the church age and the eschatological doctrines necessary to be taught in the church age that ultimately taught, speaking about the resurrection of the church, the rapture of the church, synonymous, the tribulation going on into the millennial reign. These individuals had this information by divine inspiration. Now, when you think about the writers of the New Testament, predominantly it was the apostles that wrote the New Testament. Many of the books, other than things like Luke, and also we have, again, you have Matthew, Mark, and then you have Luke. Again, those Mark and Luke, those two were not apostles, but Matthew and John were. But as I've shared with you before, both uh, Luke and uh, Mark, in the writing of their gospel, remember Luke was closely associated with Paul, so basically the book of Luke is Paul's Uh, 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 gospel accounts, as it were. And then when you talk about Mark, he was uh, closely associated with Peter. And so the gospel of Mark, we could really call Peter's gospel if you wanted to get more technical in regard to it. But then you have individuals like James and Jude who wrote other books. Those two were individuals closely associated to the apostles during that time and ultimately wrote those books. But nevertheless, I digress because the apostles who wrote the New Testament and understood the mystery doctrines for the church age, were given that information, divinely inspired by God the Holy Spirit, and it was part of their gift of apostle and that section of the apostle gift that was as a prophet. So not only did they write the New Testament as apostles slash prophets, but ultimately they were able to teach these things to the early church also. Those who had the gift of prophet, now maybe uh, James and Jude had that gift because they certainly were not apostles and never accounted as the twelve apostles. 
But when we see those two individuals, ultimately uh, we recognize that they might have had the gift of prophet and then utilize that gift in the writing, the divinely inspired writing of the New Testament books that we have uh, in the canon of Scripture. So in any case, these individuals were able to teach the mystery doctrines for the church age, teach about the end times for the church age knowledge that is necessary for you and I today, and communicate it to the early church. These individuals were fantastic individuals that were given that unique spiritual gift and the unique understanding and inspiration by the Holy Spirit to teach those things. As you know, the teachers or the pastor teachers are third in that list, and the pastor teachers are the ones that continue to exist today. But the pastor teacher, we'll talk more about this on Sunday, is the individual who's not receiving divine inspiration, but ultimately he's being led by the Holy Spirit to understand what has already been divinely inspired called the New Testament Scriptures. And he digs into that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and teaches it to the congregation. Once we have the completed canon of Scripture, the gift of apostle was no longer necessary. The gift of prophet was no longer necessary. And we see those gifts ceasing by, if not before, 96 A.D. So these individuals, again, also... To be a prophet, just as the other communication gifts of evangelist, pastor, teacher, and apostle were men and men only. Again, giving authority in the church over the body of Christ. God would not give the woman authority over the body of Christ, especially in the teaching ministry and the administration of it, based on the things that happened all the way back in the Garden of Eden. But basically, men are the ones that receive this gift, so no woman can call herself a prophet, even though you see in the Pentecostal realms that they have Mrs. and Mrs. Prophet this and that or another thing and they love to use these titles along with Apostle this and Apostle that but again those are just uh, abuses of what they uh, what uh, of the titles that were given to the early church and the abuse of the legitimate spiritual gifts to the church that no longer exists today. So these men had the limited teaching ministry during the early church, and it also related to the contemporary events of what was going on. So not only did these individuals have the ability to teach the mystery doctrines for the church age, but they also could get into some prophecy as well. And they could forewarn about impending disaster or impending difficulties or even impending good things that were, or blessings that would come from God for a specific geographic location, maybe the various cities that uh, they were in and the various churches that they were associated with. They also had the ability to do that as well. And that we take from what we understand the Old Testament prophets, who too were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And those prophets all were, for for the most part, for Israel. And God would inspire those individuals to give Israel a message, to tell them about impending doom because of their reversionism, or impending blessing because of the righteousness that they were going forward in. So the prophets of the New Testament had some of that ability, but predominantly it was a teaching gift and a teaching ministry so that people could understand how to live the unique spiritual life of the church age based on no longer being under the law. And so that was the importance of this gift is to transition individuals who were steeped in the law and get them over to understand the mystery doctrines for the church age and the grace orientation of the church age where we are no longer under the law of Israel. So in Acts chapter 13, it talks a little bit about that. And then we also understand that, again, they proclaimed the word of God in response to God's divine call. Again, when God would inspire them to go to a city or to go to a place and communicate the doctrine, they would get up, they would go and do it. They would go and witness the Word of God. Certainly they could evangelize as well as all of us should be able to evangelize, but these individuals were more in the teaching mode of the mystery doctrines for the church age or whatever message that that local assembly needed from God. And it's interesting how we have the 
a few of the letters that Paul wrote to the various churches, like Corinthians and like Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians, Colossians, we have those letters that have been given to us and passed down to us. And those letters were first and foremost poignant for that particular local assembly and congregation or that region of believers, as well as being important for the overall church. But as we specifically see in the book of Corinthians, there were a lot of issues and problems going on in Corinth that Paul had to write to them in order to straighten them out. Well, the prophet would be able to do that as well. And they were given that unique gift to go to a local assembly, understand the problems and the reversionism or apostasy that may be in that place, and then give the divinely inspired message to wake them up to the reality of their spiritual walk and get them back into a right place or try to get them back into a right place as God would provide. So, again, when we look at the Old Testament prophets, these individuals weren't like them, but they were similar to them. You see, the Old Testament prophets were many times national leaders for the people of Israel. And they had fantastic missions there, and we can read about them in our Old Testament scriptures, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and all these other individuals that we understand and know from the Old Testament. They were national leaders, and they had responsibility for all the people. And God gave them a message to deliver to the people of Israel, either to raise them up or to, ta- you know, to warn them of impending doom because of their reversionism and apostasy. So they were leaders in time of crisis. They were also leaders in time of prosperity, where in general they too would just teach the Word of God to the people of the area. Again, whether it be written down in the Scriptures and the letters that they had circulating during the Old Testament times, or just the message from God to the people, and again, talking to Buddy uh, Soul recently, you know, about uh, Jonah himself. Remember how Jonah went off to the, to the Ninevites, who were Gentiles, okay? They weren't Jews, but Jonah had to go to them because they were in apostasy. They were believers, but they went into reversionism and apostasy. And God uniquely sent Jonah begrudgingly, as we joke about and understand from Scripture, but begrudgingly sent Jonah to warn them and wake them up, and they received the message. He was a prophet sent by God to then to wake wake them up. So we see that same type of analogy for the New Testament uh, uh, teachers and preachers that had the gift of prophecy, but we don't see them as national leaders at all. And again, there is no national leader now in the church because why? We have Jew and Gentile, we have one body. We don't have a Jewish church, we don't have a Gentile church, we don't have an an American church, uh, uh, an Israel church, uh, a Turkey church, uh, an Iraq church. Again, we don't have churches by country, or we should not have them, according to the Word of God. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, we are one in Christ. So these prophets didn't have that type of authority, but they did have second in authority under the apostles, to go to a place and give a fantastic message. And when that message was delivered, the people had to perk up and listen to that message because they should have understood it was divinely inspired by God directly and specifically for them. And again, we see much of that in uh, the local assembly in the pastor teacher today. But again, I'm not, and no pastor teacher should be receiving divinely inspired messages that I've found in the Word of God. Our divine inspiration does come from the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit leading us to teach whatever doctrine or Bible passage He wants us to teach at a specific point in time for that local assembly. But the gift of prophecy, again, God would just give them a message and they'd go with it and be able to speak and communicate that uh, to the early church. So again, at that point in time, they were the, the final authority in the Old Testament of Bible doctrine. These prophets during the early church were to a final authority of Bible doctrine for that point in time because, again, we didn't have the completed canon of Scripture. And we're going to talk about checks and balances for these individuals in just a minute. But the gift of the early church was not related to the national leadership. They only functioned within the realm of the church, again, the body of Christ, and specifically from geographic location to geographic location. 
So the prophets spoke the divinely inspired word of God. They spoke the mystery doctrines for the church age. They were also able to speak in eschatological terms as well. Speaking of the end times and, you know, what as much as we know of the end times of the uh, church age and then the tribulation and also going into the millennial reign and then eternity future. They were able to teach those things and deliver them to the local assemblies. And remember, we see that, especially when we have like the letter of uh, First Thessalonians that, uh, uh, and, and Second Thessalonians that Paul written to the church at Thessalonica and some of his other New Testament epistles uh, when, when people were thinking, oh, the resurrection already happened. And Paul came along and said, who told you it's already happened? Why do you think we've already been resurrected? Again, you know, that was a false teacher that came in. But I've already told you of how things are going to shape out. I've already told you that if we are resurrected, or when, once the resurrection happens, the tribulation begins with the Antichrist. And do you see the tribulation as I explained it to you? Do you see the Antichrist as I explained him to you? Paul wrote back and said, you don't see those things. So again, don't believe the false teachers and their false doctrine, and don't let them scare you that the rapture has already happened. And even though Paul wrote only some of what would happen in regard to uh, Antichrist and the tribulation, John was the one who really was given that inspiration to really flesh that out for us in a lot of detail and give us full understanding. Now we have it in Scripture. But prior to it being in Scripture, these prophets and the apostles could communicate and teach these things because they received that information from the Holy Spirit and delivered it to the church. Now, in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, continuing on in regard to the spiritual gifts and now really getting into love, Paul talking about the abuse of spiritual gifts, but in that there's a very important message here. It says in verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. In other words, I am an instrument that does not make music. I'm just making sounds, but it does not make music. Again, whenever a communication gift was given, especially like the gift of tongues, speaking in foreign languages, it had to communicate something. It had to have you know, a rhythm and a rhyme and a message associated with it. And again, that's why you look at the Pentecostals from our day and age and all the gibberish and the you know, mumbo-jumbo that they're going through that makes no sense at all. And mostly it's just repeating words and phrases and sounds over and over and over again. And just to give you uh, this information, because my sister Sue asked about this a couple of last week when we talked about this, it says, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love. You know, the speaking of tongues of angels was not necessary whatsoever. It was the foreign language that they had to speak in. Again, a language that could be understood. Or if somebody had the gift of interpretation of those languages, they could translate that. But really what Paul is doing here is he says, if I have the gift of tongues, and remember what he just said about you desiring the greater gifts, but, you know, I'll show you even more with the lesser gifts. You know, the tongues of men is a lesser thing. The tongues of angels, that's a higher thing. So Paul is using this as an analogy of saying, if you have the gift of tongues, or even the gift of the language of angels, imagine that, and how great that would be. He said, even if you had that greatness, which again, they didn't, I'll show you even greater things with the lower gifts, but more importantly, as he's saying here, if you don't have love, even if you had that great gift and you could speak and sing in the tongues of angels and you didn't have love, doesn't mean anything whatsoever. And again, that's associated with all our spiritual gifts. So hopefully you flush that out. But again, speaking in tongues of man is the gift that was there. Speaking in tongues of angels is not the gift that was given there. But in any case, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Now in verse 2, here's what I wanted to get to. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. So what do we see here in regard to the gift of prophecy? We see that there is 
know all mysteries and know or have all knowledge. So again, we also see kind of a tongue-in-cheek of knowing all, which would mean we would be omniscient in our, or they would be omniscient in their understanding of the Word of God and things of this life and things of this world, which they were not. But we do see two important things that they spoke. They spoke mysteries and they spoke knowledge. And what is that? The mystery doctrines for the church age, the mystery of Christ crucified for salvation, and the knowledge, again, the New Testament epistles that hadn't been written as of yet. So again, in verse 2, we see that the gift of prophecy would be able to speak the mystery doctrines for the church age and the greater truths that we find inside the New Testament epistles that had not been written as of yet. So again, that was part of the gift of prophecy. They were ministers to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 4 and verse 22, and ordinarily spoke the message, as it says, of edification, exhortation, and consolation. You see, the gift of prophecy, this is what they were to do. They weren't just to go around and excite people about end times prophecy. And again, as you know, many people get all jacked up when you talk about the tribulation and the rapture and the millennial reign and the second coming of Christ and they want to come to church and they want to hear about those things. And some people, that's all they want to hear about. Well, you know, it's good to know those things, but knowing those things doesn't do a lick for you to live every day inside the divine dynosphere or inside of God's power system. Again, inside God's grace system for your life. It does you no good whatsoever to live today the unique spiritual life of the church age to know those things. So again, when people just desire end times prophecy and they just want that, want that, want that, there's something off in their spiritual life. And you've got to get away from that. It's good to have the knowledge and know it and use it, again, as a comfort and as a peace as to the plan of God for mankind but it's not going to tell you how to deal with that person on the job. It's not going to tell you how to raise your children. It's not going to teach you how to love your husband or love your wife. It's not going to teach you how to operate inside your neighborhood or inside your church or to utilize your spiritual gift. It's not going to help you whatsoever. So the gift of prophecy and the gift of prophet, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let's go there. And then in verse 1, it says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And again, very important. Hey, that's a good gift to want to have, because you'll be a teacher of people. It says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. All right, so here we have the gift of prophecy. Speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. What's edification? Building up the person. Building up their soul with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What's exhortation? Again, get them off the wrong path that they've been walking on and get them back into the plan of God and continue to encourage them to go forward inside the plan of God. And then what's consolation? Help. 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 Help them where they need help. Help them where they have problems. Help them where they have difficulties. And do that through the teaching of God's Word. Again, console them when necessary. If they're in the down, you know, had a difficulty within their life, give them consolation. Help them to understand maybe the plan of God. Help them to know, you know, what God has in mind for them in the future. Help them to encourage them not to get depressed over the down times of life and instead continue to go forward inside of God's plan. So edification, exhortation, consolation, this is what the gift of prophecy was all about. Just as the pastor teacher does these things by teaching the Word of God. Just as the person with the gift of exhortation does these things or the gift of showing mercy or the gift of helps does these things as all of us should be doing these things in our general service towards the church. Edify people, exhort people, and console them or consolation. Help to lift them and raise them up when times are down. So, 
Again, just not to get confused, we're going back to verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for, the one understand, uh, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. And again, this is not talking about that gift just being a mumbo-jumbo. And again, this is one of those verses that they abuse and uh, they use wrongly. But basically what it's saying, when you're speaking in a foreign language that you never spoke before, okay, Again, you're having a conversation with God, and God's divinely inspiring you with that information. But remember, on the day of Pentecost, they came out and they spoke in tongues because people were speaking or from places where they spoke their native tongue was a foreign language. So we know that people would understand them. But the point here is in the comparison. Again, he's trying to say you're abusing the gift of tongues, and so stop abusing it. And instead, speak in such a way that you edify, exhort, and console. And remember, there was also the gift of interpretation of tongues, so people could hear a foreign language and translate it into the current language that is spoken in that area. So we can't take this one verse and take it out of context and say, well, there you go, I can just speak gibberish, and I'm speaking the language of God in the tongues of angels. No, we don't take that out of context in that way. Ultimately, we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we understand Paul's intent. He was downplaying tongues and trying to raise up these other gifts that would edify people, exhort people, because certainly they weren't doing that with the gift of tongues. Okay? So, just so you're not too confused in uh, these other matters. So, occasionally, the prophet was empowered to make authoritative announcements of the divine will of God, especially in particular cases. And in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and forward, we see that. They also could utter predictions of future events, as we see in Acts chapter 11, verse 28, and also in chapter 22, verse 10. Let's look at those couple uh, now. Let's go to the book of Acts. And I'm not going to read all of those passages, but... We'll read some of them. Because in Paul's day, there was a man by the name of Agabus, and Agabus had the gift of prophet and prophecy. And he came to Paul specifically in, on a number of occasions and, and specifically warned him that, hey, Paul, if you go and do this, this is what's going to happen to you. And so in Acts chapter 13... Let's just get the introduction now. Let me get to that book, my uh, chapter myself. It says, Now there, uh, they, uh, there were at Antioch in the church, that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, uh, called uh, uh, Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, who had been uh, brought up with, uh, with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now notice what they called these individuals that I just listened to. They called them prophets. Okay, So we see the prophets ultimately having this uh, authority and responsibility of teaching. Now uh, let's go back to, let's go forward to chapter 21 and in verse 10. In Acts chapter 21, verse 10, and here we have you know, Paul on his missionary journey and uh, coming down to Caesarea, and, uh, and it says, and, and uh, ultimately uh, wanting to head to Jerusalem, it says, And as we were staying there for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when he had heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, uh, uh, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. 
So this guy Agabus said to Paul, hey, if you're going to go into Jerusalem, because you know, Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem to witness to the Jews, it was in his heart, it was in his heart, but he was getting warned by God not to go to that place. And if you do go to that place, you're going to be bound and ultimately imprisoned as he was. When he went there, he was bound and imprisoned, and then he was carted off to Rome and then had, uh, as you know, uh, imprisonment and house arrest there in Rome and was stuck there for the rest of his ministry. So it's very interesting that, you know, God used the prophet to try to warn him not to go. But Paul, again, you know, forged ahead and said, you know, God's will be done. But at the same time, what God took as a discipline was ultimately turned into blessing for the entire church because Paul wrote many more books called the prison epistles while he was there in Rome. But uh, so we see the prophet here, Agabus, being used by the Holy Spirit, coming to Paul and saying, hey, you shouldn't go to this place because ultimately it's going to be difficult or it's going to be a problem for you. So we see that as the gift of prophet and prophecy. Again, that was a fortune or foretelling as to what would happen to Paul. But the individual was a proclaimer of the Word of God, as Acts 13, 21, as we've noted, 15, 32. And then we also see in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, and as I said to you in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, they were to know all mysteries and all knowledge. They knew the mystery doctrines, they knew the other doctrines inside the New Testament epistles. So the prophecy also had to be doctrinally accurate coming from the mouths of these individuals. And the Word of God tells the early church, and again, part of the gift of prophet was also to warn the early church to test the teachers and the prophets, to make sure that what they were saying was accurate. And we even have understanding from the New Testament scriptures that if they said one thing that was inaccurate, they were disqualified as a prophet. Because the gift, the spiritual gift of prophet and prophecy was divinely inspired by God the Holy Spirit and would be 100% accurate. Now, there could have been individuals during that day that had the gift and were going forward and accurate at first, but then may have fallen into reversionism and said, you know, I'm going to go off on my own here and do my own thing and maybe give teachings or prophets, uh, prophecies on their own. And if they were proven to be false, ultimately uh, they were to be removed as a prophet of that, uh, that area uh, and of the church. So... They had to be doctrinally accurate. 1 Corinthians 14, 13, we just noted that. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, that they were responsible for revealing the mysteries of Christ. And ultimately, as I didn't have up on the board, but I'll remind you, there was a temporary gift of what? Discerning spirits. And remember when we talked about discerning of spirits, not only could they determine what type of demon possession an individual might have had, but they also could determine who is a true prophet and who is a false prophet. And that's what that gift of discerning spirits was all about, to determine the truth from the lie, the truthful prophet from the false prophet. So again, the church was given a temporary spiritual gift to, uh, to determine whether this person was a truth teller or a liar uh, based on what they were saying. Because remember, they didn't have the Bible to back up what the individual is saying. Today we have the Bible, and you can back up everything I say. And if I say it and it's in the Bible, it's truth. If I say it and it's not in the Bible, it's not truth. Okay, It's a lie. And that's how you determine false teachers today, not by the gift of discerning spirits, but by knowing your scripture and whether the pastor is teaching the truth or a lie. All right, so continuing on, a couple more points on prophecy. I may not get out of prophecy tonight, but evangelism is pretty quick because I think we understand that. But prophecy did not involve a state of ecstasy or any relinquishing of the prophet's own personality and or will. And again, you know, uh, maybe picking on the Pentecostals, but they leave themselves open for uh, picking on because they are abusing many of these spiritual gifts today. But they will, you know, fake or forgery of the gift of prophecy, where again, they'll be like, you know, go into a state of trance, 
And then they'll have, you know, be doing this, that, and the other thing. And it's like God took over their body, and now they'll speak a message because God took over their body. That is not what the gift of prophecy was all about. God divinely inspired these individuals, just as he did with the apostles and the writers of the New Testament scriptures, but he never relinquished their being and their thought process and their knowledge. He never took over their bodies and possessed them to deliver a message. He would divinely inspire, but they would speak from their own will and from their own accord, from their own power and resources to move the lips and to think with their brain based on having doctrine inside the mentality of their soul. So again, as the forgeries and fakeries continue today, that uh, in the Old Testament time periods uh, and in the New Testament early church, these individuals were not possessed or taken over by the deity to speak these things. So again, we see falsehoods in our day and age, as even back in the early church, I'm sure they had falsehoods uh, in the gift of prophecy as well. 1 Corinthians 14, 29-33. False prophecy and prophets, again, were distinguished. I, uh, I mentioned this already. I'll go through this slide really quick. I've given you these passages. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, also a warning about false prophets. Again, they had distinguishing gifts to understand whether it was a truth prophet, a truthful prophet, or a false prophet. And then as with the apostles, the prophets had the foundational ministry of the early church. And as we have in Ephesians 2.20, if we've already studied, remember, the church was built on what? The apostles and prophets. The two individuals of ministry, uh, uh, ministry, of communication of the mystery doctrines for the church age, missionary gifts, plus the teaching of the greater truths of the word of God came from the apostles and prophets. The two temporary gifts that established a teaching ministry inside the body of Christ in the early church. But once, as we know, the the canon of scriptures were completed, those gifts ceased to exist, and now it's the pastor, teacher, and the evangelist that carry the torch of missionary work and also the teaching of the greater truths found in the New Testament. So the final point that we have in regard to prophecy is that Christians today do not get their spiritual knowledge immediately from the Holy Spirit. Again, it's not like God saying to Agabus, hey, go tell Paul this information right now. Okay? We don't get the information immediately by the Holy Spirit through the gift of prophet and prophecy. But we get it immediately, not immediately, but immediately through the Holy Spirit, through His teaching ministry, working inside of you to learn the Word of God as He also is leading the, the pastor teacher to delve into the truths of the New Testament and teach them to the congregation at the right time, at the right place. And again, I teach you the Word of God and the Holy Spirit's working through me to teach. He's working through you to learn and He's teaching us information that we will apply at some point during our lives. As I've said to you before, many of these things we have to apply the next day. And, we've, and all of you have come back to me at some point and said, you know, I had to, you taught it last night and I had to use it the next morning. Other times you'll learn it tonight, but you'll use it a week from now, a month from now, maybe a year from now. You'll specifically use that word. But again, the Holy Spirit prepared you, and you made yourself available to His teaching ministry through positive volition so that you could learn and be edified so that you had the information, the right information, at the right time. So again, we shouldn't be looking for prophets to fill up our data bank for what we need to know today. We should always be delving into the Word of God under the authority of our right pastor teacher so that we learn the truths of the Word and can apply them when we need them. All right, so that was a lot about prophecy and the gift of prophet. Now we're going to get into the gift of evangelism and evangelism. And uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this because it's pretty straightforward. But there are a few important things I do want to share with you in regard to the evangelist. Now, from an etymology standpoint, the evangelist is similarly transliterated from the Greek language into the English. And we see that up on the board. But I also want to point out to you that in the Greek, when we have an NG in the English and we get the ing sound, 
That's a double G in the Greek. The Greek uses double G, and the first G you pronounce as an N, and the second as the G for the ing sound. So that's why we have euangelistes is the Greek word for evangelist. And the evangelist, too, was a speaker, someone who communicated information. Uh, it's come down to be the preacher or the proclaimer of good news, and specifically the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this word, too, was used in the ancient Greek language to be anybody that would be a speaker of good news, and sometimes it would be bad news as well. But they would be a communicator of information, news that people needed to hear. And many times it was used predominantly for those who would speak the news about what was happening on the battlefield. And you know, you probably all know about Achilles, okay, back in the Greek mythology and how, and there's actually some truth to it, but Achilles was an individual, if I'm getting this right, correct me if I'm wrong on this, okay, going outside of scripture here, so... You know, if I'm wrong, that's fine. But in any case, Achilles, I thought, was an individual who had a message that the Greeks were winning a battle in Marathon, and he, no, 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 is that the right, is that the right guy? Maybe it's the wrong guy. But in any case, was a guy who ultimately learned about a battle down in Marathon. I'll have to bone up on my Greek mythology. Learned about a battle in, Mithar- in Marathon, and he ran about 26 miles to deliver the report of how the battle was going to the generals and the leaders of Greek. And that's where we get the word marathon from. Maybe I'm getting my mythology mixed up. But this was an individual who also... Achilles was a great warrior, and supposedly he couldn't die just by a regular death, but when he was shot in the Achilles tendon, as we call it today, ultimately that is what killed him, okay? But again, part of Greek mythology. Why am I going off of this? But in any case, I'm trying to get a communication of an individual like an evangelist, somebody who's running down the street and giving information. Back in the uh, ancient days of uh, England and also the United States, you'd call that the town crier, right? They'd stand on the corner and they would deliver the news to people. So in any case, what's important for us to know is that this is an individual that communicates what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And that's what euangelistas ultimately means. The U on the front end means good, and then angelos on the back end is the Greek word that means a messenger, or preacher. And so it's, again, a preacher of the good news. That's what this gift is uh, for the New Testament church that continues to exist today. This is a permanent gift that continues throughout the church age. Interestingly enough, euangelites is only used three times in the New Testament scriptures. It's used in Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And there it is in regard to uh, Philip that we noted previously. We read about him in the book of Acts, Philip the Evangelist. It's given in our passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, one of the important communication gifts for the early church. And then again in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, where Timothy, who is a pastor teacher with the gift of pastor teacher, is also exhorted by Paul to do what? The work of an evangelist. So the pastor teacher also has to continue to deliver the evangelist uh, message, again, of Christ crucified for salvation. So this gift is an individual who has the supernatural ability, and again, given only to men, to effectively communicate the gospel message to win the lost of this world and win them over to Christ. They are the ones that talk about Christ as the Savior, that He is the only way for salvation. They are the ones that talk about the payment of penalty of sin on the cross by Jesus Christ, and through Him we have eternal life. They are the ones that make the message known that if you believe in Christ, you have eternal life. If you do not, there is eternal condemnation. And they have a unique ability to deliver that message. And many times with that gift is other abilities that God has given them to be an exciting speaker. To be an exciting speaker that captivates people and captivates their attention, especially the unbeliever. 
and they captivate their attention so that people would give a hearing to their message and want to hear what they have to say. And they have that unique ability to say it in such a way that excites people and raises people up and lifts people up so that they hear the gospel message. And then hopefully from there, we'll believe in that gospel message as well. So again, it's a unique gift that also comes with uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 side aspect of this gift to be itinerant, as we call it, but ultimately means they have to be able to move from place to place. They don't hunker down like a pastor teacher in one local assembly behind one pulpit and teach there for the rest of their lives, as it were. Again, they move from place to place to place wherever God leads them to deliver the gospel message. Because remember, the unbeliever isn't coming into the church to hear the gospel message. They're not going to step through that doorway. Sometimes they will if they're invited or dragged by a friend. But they're outside the church, and that's where the evangelist has to go. Outside the church, whether it be publicly or privately, ultimately giving the gospel message. Communicate the gospel to those who are outside the local assembly, not to those who are inside the local assembly. Yes, the evangelist can come and be invited to preach from behind a pulpit, but it should be a special event where people from the church are bringing people who are unbelievers to hear the evangelist. Because their gift is for the unsaved. They're to reach out to those who are lost and dying in this world. They are to reach out to the unreachable, those who aren't coming into the church, those who are on the streets and in the back alleys who need the gospel message. They have a unique ability to go out and and reach those people, as Philip did in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21, talking about the Ethiopian eunuch that we've read about who he met on a road and witnessed to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, again, this individual is somebody that people will pay attention to just because of the charismatic nature of their ability to speak and the gift that they have of witnessing the gospel message. So they give that message in a clear and concise way so that people have an opportunity to choose for or against Christ. As we noted, Philip is the one evangelist that is noted specifically with that title of evangelist in Acts chapter 21, as we've noted, but we see him operating in Acts chapter 8 uh, in verses 5, all, really all the way down to verse 40, but in various sections there. Now, the important thing is that pastor teachers do not have the gift of evangelists, but as I said to you before in 2 Timothy 4, 5, we are instructed to give the Uh, give the message of the evangelist and continue to evangelize in our own local assembly and maybe in our own geographic location from time to time. But we aren't to spend our time there predominantly, but give the gospel message when led by the Holy Spirit. At the same time, as you know, all believers are mandated to give the gospel message. So all of us have a little evangelism inside of us, and we are little evangelists that we are to give the gospel message to those in our periphery who don't have salvation. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, in the book of Acts, book of Matthew, with the great commission that Jesus Christ said, go out and make disciples of the world. I'm going to send you out to all the world. Again, they are to do that. As Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20 tells us, we are all royal ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'll leave you with this, is that the apostles and prophets, as we noted in the book of Ephesians, laid the foundation for the early church. Now the evangelist is to continue that work and to continue to grow the church. Really, the evangelist is the one that grows the church because they're out communicating the gospel so that people come to salvation and are brought into the church, become members of the body of Jesus Christ. Again, the apostles and prophets laid the foundation. Now the evangelist builds upon that foundation by bringing more people in and more people and growing that church by winning the lost to Jesus Christ. And then when we come back on Sunday, we'll talk about the gift of pastor teacher and their their job is to edify the church. Again, build it eternally, strengthen the church with the teaching of the Word of God.
All right, so that's prophet and evangelist and these two communication gifts. On Sunday, we'll talk all about pastor teachers. All right, so we'll do that on Sunday. So let's close in prayer right now. And I can stop sweating as our air conditioning is not working tonight. But in any case, Father, we just thank you for this time. We praise you. We uh, honor you. We glorify you. We give thanks to you for our own personal spiritual gift and these unique gifts that you gave to the church that really start the church and continue the church, uh, really the spokespersons of the Word of God to those who are lost and dying in this world. And we can't thank you enough for having them in our own personal lives where we could grow and learn and know the gospel and then grow thereafter in the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you continue to grow us in our souls and edify our souls so that we are better vessels of honor for you. So, Father, we thank you for our time together. We ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen. You may say something.